Welcome to Death and Aliens, an in-depth look at horror and sci-fi TV from two friends who vaguely know what they're doing. I'm MK. I'm Courtney. And Courtney, and how and this is Sadie. And Courtney, how are you? I'm well. If you look at me, for those of you on the video podcast, I accidentally went a little gothy with my makeup look today. Um the very pale eye and pale foundation. Um I think it'll red. And the reddest lips. <laughs> um, so, but it feels right. So it feels like it fits my mood. Um, yeah. I was not given my frosty today, which was very unfortunate. And it has just set me into a spiral. But in better news, I did finally watch, finish my um, Harry Potter watch oh, through good. last night instead of doing any of the responsibilities I was supposed to do. But I finally watched it. I watched the reunion. It was lovely. I laughed. I cried. I mean, just to be very clear, um, we're recording this on Monday, the 29th of January, which if you follow the podcast, you will know there was no Sci-Fi Sunday so far yet this week. It's coming. But yesterday when I could have been editing it, um, I was helping Dan finish Hogwarts Legacies. Did he finish too? Yeah, he finished the whole game. Oh my gosh, so did um, Nick. And I'm like, so he, never he finished the whole shit. game, including like I was sitting there on the computer looking up walkthroughs of where to find chests. And then he kept taking the controller mm-hmm. from me. And I was like, you're doing it wrong. And I took it. And like, so I was, um, instead of editing the podcast and posting it, I was beating all words like, see. So, like, that's just where we're at. I was also supposed to be editing, but instead at 1 a.m., I was watching the Hogwarts reunion. So, you know. Can't throw throw stones in flat houses. What is the saying? People Those who live in glass houses people. can't throw stones. Yeah, I was like, wait a second. These are not the right order of anything I'm trying to say. Stones in glass houses. Look, look, I don't know. <laughs> don't throw stones in glass houses either. I don't, but like, whatever. Yeah. Um. So I'm, I was thrilled to finish my Harry Potter rewatch and watch the um reunion for the first time. It was very good. If you haven't seen it yet. I'm two years late. I get it. But if you haven't seen it yet. If you haven't seen it yet, I'm just warning you that there's one scene in particular that um, I watched it before the actor passed away and I can't watch it again because watching it after um, is going to fuck me up forever. It's really sad. It's so sad. But yes, so um, how are you? I am genuinely concerned for the well-being of the future of America. I thought you were going to say for me, but also America. That's fine too. Um, so on Thursday, I went to Target and I walked to my shelf where I always buy my new pair of jeans every couple weeks when I forget to do laundry and don't and need to buy new jeans. And I walked up to the shelf and I was like, oh, wow, it's really full today. That never happens. And then I realized that all of the jeans on that shelf were flare. <laughs> look here's the thing i have big calves i don't mind a flare because the straight leg are too much for me. the straight leg the skinny jeans all of those no. i first of all my calves are the only part of my body i want people to look at step one step two i live in buffalo in the winter i can't have flare leg pants they turn into puddle wipers does anyone not remember the fact that we used to wear these giant fucking flare pants and then they would be wet up to the knees because they would just soak up every ounce of water that was on the ground and the water is covered in rock salt i need a skinny jean that i can tuck into my boots it is not about fashion it's about style or about um practicality that's the word i'm looking for and yes i personally think it looks better but i love a good flare leg when when it works but in the winter in buffalo excuse me you can't just stop selling skinny jeans what the fuck is wrong (laughs) with you look get a thicker boot stuff it in there a whole ass flare leg what do you want me to wear michelin (laughs) man boots maybe you do what you gotta do. You do. I bet those are really comfortable too. Probably. But even when I used to wear big puffy boots, I still wore leggings. I've always. I'm really good at like stuffing pants into into shoes and boots. 
Granted, I can't say anything right now. I'm wearing um, boots that are not winter boots that I have just completely let the laces fall out of and the tongues are just like flapped over. Like I'm living in the like in 93 in a grunge scene. And that's what I wear every day. So like maybe don't maybe don't listen to my advice. Um, but yeah, so I literally just stared at a shelf for a significant amount of time and was like, oh God, it's happening. Gen Z is taking over. We don't have skinny jeans anymore. And I cried. I mean, you knew it was coming. You knew Gen Z taking over was coming. Thank you. But it's bad enough they brought middle parts back. Now they... Now yeah, they that's some mind. nonsense. I still don't get that. Do you see how big my side part is? Like, <laughs> insane. Not a thing I'm working. I'm working doing. No. My, I mean, to be fair, I don't have a part. I have a whatever the fuck my hair does on its own. Like, and sometimes that's here and sometimes that's the middle and sometimes that's all the fucking way over here. Who knows? Uh, don't talk to me. But <laughs> m- middle parts and flare jeans, I reject. So I guess that's, I guess that's fair. I love a flare jean, but I also, I mean, I grew up in the South, so it was wet 100% of the time. And so now that I'm in like New York City, it's not as wet most of the time. Right. So you're like just expressing the freedom you never got to express as a child. Exactly. I am enjoying a little flair. I speaking of expressing freedom, you never enjoyed it. You got to enjoy as a child. I don't remember who I was talking to, but I literally said, have you I literally said you look like the kind of person who's never been cut in the face by a spiked belt in a stage dive and it shows. I will say I have not been cut in the face by one because I did not go to shows that you could do that. But I'm from, again, small town. So we yeah. only have the opportunity. Um, Warp Tour didn't come to me. Mm, um, yeah, I was going to say I but have, I've, but Warp Tour. <laughs> right. But I've been cut plenty of time. Just yeah. not in the face specifically. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, I... I'm worried about the future of America because they they don't know what we had to endure to be where we are today. Everything. Well, you saw oh. them trying to bring back the low rise jeans. You saw that nonsense. God knows. How how can you possibly get like butt fillers and wear low rise jeans? That doesn't. No, it's Nothing scientifically so not possible. No, to fit that much butt into that much pants there's a song about it is that the thong song no something about how how she put those butt inside them jeans it's a rap song <laughs> From yeah, i know but now i'm but now i can't think of what <laughs> song it is and i need to know sadie my god <sighs> get down hey i'm so sorry for yelling into the mic down she's trying to climb on my desk I do. I do sincerely apologize. I didn't think that through when I started yelling. It's okay. Um, while I'm looking up this song, um, is it? Oh my god. Um, is it "Dem Jeans" by Chingy? No, I was thinking. Um, oh, were you thinking of my humps? Piece. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think that's the one. <laughs> I was just like, wait, I think it was Black Eyed Peas. You said, I was like, mm, um, I think that's the one. But no, um, there is a song called um, Dem Jeans by Chingy featuring Jermaine yeah. Dupree. And the lyrics literally say how you get that ass all up in them jeans. I oh. look, <laughs> I love Jermaine Dupree. <laughs> we had a request to sample one of our works. And I was like, I don't care what this is. Somebody approve it. This was like a few months ago, like not a thousand years ago when people <laughs> knew who he was. So no one in my office knows who he is but me. I don't think it happened. I don't remember what it was for. But I just saw the name come through and I was like, everyone, excuse me. Everyone, <laughs> yes, please. We need to do this. It's very important. Um, You know, it is as important as Jermaine Dupri. Our spiritual health. Yes. 100%. I love it. Well, to go with my mood gonna stay strong and one day 
I decided that instead of continuing to put band-aids over bullet holes, that I would clean and mend my wounds, even if it meant it would hurt for a while before it got better. J.D. Lynn. Love that. Love that. That well, nice. nice. The, um, the band-aid that we're putting over the bullet hole of our life right now is um, Stargate. Because unfortunately, I feel like this episode can really only be considered a band-aid, not a mend. Is it a band-aid? Or does it stab you like the belts that you wore in the 2000s? It's anyone's guess. <laughs> um, this episode is Stargate SG-1 Season 5, Episode 6, Rite of Passage. Uh, it is only rated 6.8 stars. So let's just yeah. raise Shocking. the bat. <laughs> Color me shocked. Um, it came out on August 3rd, 2001. And um, the closer we get to September, the more nervous I get about the on this day. Because <laughs> um, granted, these episodes came out on Fridays and September 11th happened on a Tuesday. But like, I have a feeling the world's about to get really weird. Uh, so yeah. I'm just bracing myself um because the world also got really weird right before like this week um just in a different way um because the number one book was called suzanne's diary for nicholas by james patterson um i have I know never james patterson i was gonna say i despite the fact that james patterson has probably written a book in every genre that exists of books and by a book i mean 600 I have mm-hmm. never read a single James Patterson book. I've definitely read James Patterson books, and I think I've read some that he wrote and some that he, like, instructed on. But I've definitely yeah. read, like, a few different ones. Um, not the big ones, but I've read a lot, of, like, five right. of them. Okay. Um, and it's good. I enjoy it. It's just, it's just your everyday detective series type writer. But That's he, what you get with James Patterson. Yeah, except I was just watching a TikTok from a librarian. Mm-hmm. James Patterson, he has all the books that he's known for, his detective stuff and whatever, but he's also written like a random shit ton of nonfiction. He, oh, he mm-hmm. has like a whole ass adult, like young adult series. Mm-hmm. Like, was it the Alex Cross series? Didn't he do that one? Did he do the Alex Cross one? I don't know, but I knew he did a a youth one, but he wrote with Bill Clinton for like some political stuff. Like, like, yeah, it's crazy. James Patterson has just written everything. Um, and uh, I want to be him. Yeah, he did write the Alex Cross series. Um, oh, and the Maximum Ride series. Is that part of the Alex Cross world? Right. But I know the Maximum Ride series too. Yeah. Yeah. No one oh, told me act- today that I should move to my parents and become the next Jane pa- James Patterson because everyone knows I don't like to stay in a genre either. But <laughs> he also, I mean, to be fair, he um it's probably more likely to be the um he wrote the stories and then they were adapted, but mm-hmm. he's the author on like a shit ton of manga and like graphic novels hey that one i didn't know <laughs> i thought um, i knew a lot about james patterson but that is not one of them no he also wrote some stuff that is like genuinely um even younger than young adults um like middle to middle grades books mm-hmm. including a book called middle school get me out of here which i have heard of and a book I that I heard hadn't that. heard of, but I would like to, called How I Survived Bullies, Broccoli, and Snake Hill. That's I don't I don't I don't amazing. know what it is, but I, I need it. I need it. Um yeah. He's like an empire in himself. He himself <laughs> yeah. is an empire. And I've also like heard that um there's a lot of things where he like isn't actually the main writer, but he like wrote pieces or did Mm -hmm. work with them and so his name is on things yeah and there's some like mixed feelings about that like some people are like that is just like him stealing other people's work 
And on the one hand, I get it. But on the other hand, I'm sure those people don't mind having James Patterson's name recognition pulling their books yeah. up. Because yeah, it's not like I, it's not like it's not like he took ideas and then just put his name on it. Most of his right. younger, most of his children's and young adult books have like four author names on it because it's him with the other people. So like these people mm -hmm. are now getting pushed up by his name recognition. Yeah, I I get I hear the argument a lot with like like Stephen King does similar stuff too, mm -hmm. and like there are some authors that I think do genuinely just like give advice and then throw their name on something but i feel like james patterson like has a hand in it like yeah. like, like these manga books like they're they're maximum ride so like they're based off of the yeah no, no it's like, it's like he wrote so, a novel and then he helped adapt the novel into a graphic exactly. novel yeah so like and, it, and again it would be different if it was just like just his name and he wasn't helping these people but it's the same thing as like someone's gonna take like a selena gomez writing credit on their song because they know that it's gonna make them exactly thousands of more dollars than it would have if they didn't you know even That's if she's like, singing it but not writing it so it's the it's the same as like like for an example like for S the stargate um devlin and um roland emmerich and devlin whatever his name is the guys who wrote the movie who came up with the movie 92 percent of the tv show not their idea are they mm -hmm. credited for every goddamn episode absolutely nope. because their idea started something and without them yep. we wouldn't be here they're, they're the concept have, they really have nothing to do with most of the tv oh, show that's the dream that's what i want to do do one thing that's <laughs> absolutely terrible and then someone take that idea run with and it make and it then make me millions <laughs> absolutely that is my new goal in life yes um so the, that was the number one book uh the number one song <laughs> The number one song was Bootylicious by Destiny's Child. Oh, look, I love it. Speaking of keeping those booties, those jeans. <laughs> right. Um, and then oh, also... Okay, never mind. I can't tell you on the podcast. Oh, you also, also, weirdly, somehow I feel like related to keeping your booty correctly in your jeans, the number one movie was Rush Hour 2. <laughs> And that just what feels like alive. that just feels like something Chris Rock would have said in that movie. Or I'm sorry, oh, Chris yeah. Tucker. Chris Tucker would. It's Chris Tucker in that movie, right? It's Chris Tucker. Yeah, that just feels like something Chris Tucker would have said in that movie. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I was like, these are not connected, but they also feel very much like they're connected. I didn't see all of the Rush Hour movies, but I've seen a couple of them. And I just like they always make me laugh. Chris My Tucker aunt is obsessed with Jackie Chan, though. She like well, she loves yeah. like asian fighting movies and stuff who did i just find out oh my brother was it my brother said he was gonna yeah it was my brother my brother said he was gonna leave his fiance um last week because she didn't know who jackie chan was okay Look. <laughs> um and here's i the laughed thing. but <laughs> um here's the thing that's bad enough but also for those of you who don't know what it was like to be a, a PBS kid in the 2000s, um, there are some things that were um, life-defining for my family that I feel like weren't for most other people until I meet other awkward PBS kids. And one of those was the Jackie Chan Adventures. I did not watch <laughs> the Jackie Chan Adventures. I was a PBS kid. But I thought you were going to talk about that Asian cat show. Oh, Sagwa? The one that I, Sagwa is the one that, yeah. like, if you if you knew that Sagwa existed, we can still be friends. If you don't, I have questions about yeah. how you were brought up. That um, was my favorite one. I did not get into Jackie Chan Adventures. I didn't get into Jackie Chan until, like, middle school. Hmm. So Jackie Chan Adventures was one of those, like, life-defining shows for us. Um, That's in fair. a way that I don't think is true for anyone else's family the way it is for mine well, like, like also if you're looking at pbs there are a lot of choices and yeah. for that to be the one you ended up on is uh, interesting well, no, and i mean by far not the only one also actually i don't think that was on pbs i think that might have been once we got cable oh maybe that's what it was because i never that maybe that's why i didn't watch it because i was maybe i think kid. that that one might have been once we actually got cable um no um but we my family 
is very odd. Like we watched all of those shows. We are, everyone in my family is kind of as into TV as I am where like we just watch everything. Right. But we have like weird, weird things that like become inside jokes or conversations that I try to tell other people about and they don't get it and they don't find it funny. And I'm like, I really wish I really can't have friends that aren't my siblings because no one else understands me. Um, and Jackie Chan is one of them. <laughs> So. It was on Cartoon Network, Kids WB, Disney Channel, and the WB. Oh, so I the did kids, watch the WB. It, it, the Kids WB, Saturday mornings yeah. on the Kids WB, that's where mm-hmm. it was. It was not cable. It was not cable. It was Saturday morning cartoons on the Kids WB. That's that where makes it was. sense. I did I was, see those. I, was like, I didn't have Kids WB on my TV to watch. It was like Channel 7 on Saturdays or whatever. Not 7. 7 was ABC, oh but with like four channels. Until we had any any type of cable. And then we did get it a lot like earlier than everyone else did. But it was still like, I, I lived in the middle of nowhere. You couldn't yeah. antenna <laughs> TV. I, I watched true. the Olympics. Like what? I don't, that was the first thing I watched in the house when we moved out there was the Olympics because that's what was on the TV. And that's, so that's, that's fair. You know, yeah, I did my best okay. with what I had. Fair enough. On this day of August <laughs> 2001, which um, is a weird time, um, the, uh, ooh, I feel like I'm going to sneeze. There was an IRA bombing in London. Bless you. <laughs> you looked like you were about to sneeze again, and then I wasn't. I feel like I'm about to sneeze, but nothing is happening, so we'll see. Look at the light. Look up. Look at the light. No, no. Now I just feel blind. Um, oh, I didn't take my allergy meds today. I'm fucked. Mm, oh. I didn't either. It's fine. Um, it's fine. Christopher Hewitt died. Um, he was a theater director and producer who I meant to look up who he was. Um, but I didn't. So, if you know who that is, um, it's he seemed like familiar, but I don't. Yeah, know. like the name seemed like I should know who that was. Um. But, you know, best known for Mr. Belvedere. Oh, yes. And there was. Which I've heard of and never seen. um, Mr. Belvedere. And there was another one that he. The producers. He's the 1967 producers. Yes. Um, And then he did. He was. um, (laughs) He was in an episode. He played himself in an episode of Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego. Um, Love that. Yeah. That's what I was doing. I was playing Carmen San Diego on my desktop computer instead of watching the Jackie Chan adventures. Um, but he also he went to um he made his acting debut uh um in Dublin in on a mid in the sh- the stage show of a Midsummer Night's Dream and was in the Oxford mm-hmm. rap and Went was on West End, and then he was in the Broadway, and he was um in the Unsinkable Molly Brown, My Fair Lady, The Affair. Like he was like big in the forties, fifties, um, era, yeah. like Broadway era. Um, so he was not a small name, but yeah, um, I've heard of him passing. Yeah, um. Speaking of the things that are happening in 2001 that are going to be stressful, and we're going to probably gloss over most of them, um, Bush signed the Iran and Libya Sanctions Act Extension Act that day. Um, and on timing. a much better note, Princess Diaries premiered. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I saved that one for last because the rest of them got to bring it back up. Yeah, punch them down and bring them back up. <laughs> Um, this episode was directed by Peter DeLuise, written by Heather E. Ash, and edited by Kevin Willis. So all names we know, Heather and Kevin are not as frequently brought up, but they are not new. Um, the guest star that I wouldn't want to talk about is Colleen Renison. Um, she is known for Boot Camp, Down River, and Stargate. She actually doesn't really work as much in film. Like, she still acts, but she's primarily a musician. She had um, a band and then started doing some solo stuff. She had a solo album that came out last year in 2023 called Persephone. Um, What's her name? 
uh, Colleen Renison. But fun fact, she is not who played Cassandra in season two. I thought that probably not because it's been three years and she's aged like seven. However, <laughs> she was a young child in season two of Stargate. She previously played Allie, who was the young girl who helped Teal'c when he had that weird bug attached to him. In, she was the in bug season. girl? She was the bug girl. And oh. she was... She did audition for this. They did not want to recast um, uh, Cassandra. Cassie. But, but Katie Stewart, who played Cassie in season two, um, was cast as Kitty Pride in X2. And she was filming the X-Men movie at the time that they needed to film this. Mm -hmm. And so they held auditions and um colleen auditioned and obviously they had already worked with her before and um and they chose to work with her again she was very worried she wasn't going to get cast because she's a much broader person than katie stewart yeah. is um but she was a good actress and they knew her work from her being on the show before so she got it excellent yeah. Um, and that is actually all of my um, trivia for the whole episode is just. Well, this. my trivia is that it has been 78 episodes since Cassie was on here. That is insane. Did you count? I did. Because I was like, why are we three seasons later bringing back a character that we have not mentioned one time? That's not true. They time. have mentioned her. They, she hasn't been on the show, but they have right. mentioned her. But also, part of what is true about Cassie is that they very deliberately don't bring her back often because of the idea that they wanted her to have a normal life. And so she's very much no. attached to Janet's off base life. And we find Which out that fine. we find out that but. there's a lot of communication and contact with them. And she, like I said, she has been mentioned before. She will be mentioned again. She never really fully disappears, but it's a deliberate choice to not have her on the show often. Well, I totally forgot she even existed. So I had to count how many episodes it had been since I seen her, and it's 78. So I counted yeah. out a spite. That's when I knew this was going to be a volatile episode of the podcast. <laughs> you know... So happens. we start this episode. Speaking of volatile episodes, I was not watching this episode at my house. Mm -hmm. I was watching it on Douglas's Amazon. And Douglas has not upgraded his Amazon yet. And I don't know if you guys know, but starting this week, Amazon sent everybody a little email and they said, just so you know, the price of Prime is increasing $2.99 a month. If you don't want to pay the increased price, that's fine. But now you have ads. Wait, so what do you do if you pay annually? If you pay annually, they, they still would have added a potential, they still would have given you an offer of an increased price. I would just check. check. My Check your check your emails from Amazon because um I know my dad paid the upgrade because um he was like we watch too much on Prime to deal with ads um but Doug did not and so there were ads. I mean to be fair, I'm not going either. But I mean, and to be fair, in a 45 minute episode, there were two ad breaks, so it's, it's not, not like it's not terrible. I just forgot that Amazon was going to do that and I got mad. So I tried to change it from my school email and it did not do. So I still have to log into my school email to like so figure out what they, they want. They had different rules for student pricing. I don't know because I don't have It's not student that. pricing anymore. It oh, just okay. won't let me change it from my student email oh. that I've been trying to change it from for five years. Got it. Got it. That was the bane of my existence right now. That's totally like, fair. Yeah. Amazon is the bane of everyone's existence. It's really upsetting um, that we mm -hmm. give our entire soul to the Bezos sphere. 
hundred percent. Um, but we start this episode with Sam and Janet having a birthday party for Cassandra, who is acting exactly like you would expect a bratty teenager to be acting when they'd rather be with their boyfriend on their birthday than their mom. Hundred percent. Um, and so, but apparently we find out that she's been sick recently, and so like one of the reasons she's been is acting so bratty is because. Janet has not been letting her out of the house because she's been sick. Um, but which, like, I mean, she came from a different planet. You don't can't figure out why she's sick, and you're just trying to protect her. I get it. Yeah, and I mean, and at this point, they didn't know that there was something like interplanetarily wrong with her. She just thought she had the flu. But Janet, when your mom's a doctor, you don't get to go out on a date with the flu, right? Um, but so her boyfriend's in the front porch waiting for her and she goes out to tell him that she has to do cake with her mom and he is like okay but like can i give you your birthday present and he gives her um a prism because apparently she was like talking about how pretty they were in science class and he is like awkward and the loser and doesn't know how to impress her and it's the most um innocent wholesome thing i've ever seen in my life it's very um, wholesome. and then he kisses her and the lights in the entire house flicker and she passes out. And I was like, mm-mm. and I was like, is this what happens every time? Like, this feels really inconvenient. <laughs> and I, I looked at Dan, I go, what would you do if the first time you kissed me, I just <laughs> passed out? And he goes, I don't, I don't After know. After all the lights flickered. He goes, he goes, I don't know, did the lights flicker also? Because then I have more, <laughs> more questions. Um. That's but, good. He should have questions. <laughs> correct. Um, but obviously, um, poor Dominic has serious questions and he screams for help and Janet and Sam come out on the porch and then we get the credits. So, you know, starting off slow. The wrong. <laughs> oh, I was, I was being sarcastic. <laughs> I was being so sarcastic. Um, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so, so they bring her to base and put her in the infirmary, but her fever isn't going down and she is emitting like a low level EM field. And Janet is like, I need to get a blood sample from Sam because I want to test to see if these retroviruses that are showing up on uh, Cassandra's blood work are showing up on ours to figure out if it's something like contagious or viral or whatever, or like what is happening. But right when she's trying to get all this medical stuff, like, figured out, Cassandra wakes up and says she couldn't finish the harvest and she needs to go back into the forest. I was like, this doesn't sound like a cult. I don't know (laughs) what is happening right now. It's like, I'm sorry, what? Um, So they Mm -hmm. figure out that the retrovirus that's in her blood must be from her home planet because no one else has it. And um, they cannot find anything related to it in any other medical, anything that they have in all of their records. There is no vaccine. Her fever is not going down and the retroviruses are now spreading um, to her spinal fluid. And um, Jenna is worried about like long-term brain damage. So... (laughs) Daniel joins the meeting and has been digging into notes and videos from uh, Cassandra's planet. And it turns out that like when SG seven was there, a bunch of girls that age had similar symptoms where they would just like pass out and start convulsing and freaking out and in the middle of the fields. And um, when the medical teams tried to help the parents were like, no, you can't like, it's uh you'll bring the god's wrath upon us and then the girls would just like wander back into the forest and come back three days later magically cured again sounds like a cult yeah sounds like a cult but also definitely sounds supernatural like some that is that's not like, how things if work you think about it this is like um very specifically like uh jared leto's cult like yeah. this is what i would ex- this is some crazy stuff that i'd expect from that like you just go off into the woods for three days and then come back and it's like all is well and he probably does have supernatural stuff going on i'm not saying he doesn't that can still that's, be valid that's true but, that's true um but um 
So they ask if they could go back to the planet and see if there's something happening on the planet. And um, they're worried because, you know, if you don't remember season two, because it was three seasons ago, um, Nerti like blew up the whole place. <laughs> yeah, I was like, like, I literally wrote down, I was like, do we know Nerti? And then obviously I figured out that we did. But yeah. I did not remember her. Not even no. a little bit. Yeah, no, we we for sure know her. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, she did, you know, try to kill Cassandra and her whole planet. But mm-hmm. is she not also the one who, like, who was the one who um, was fucked up the Asgard Treaty? Sure don't remember what you're talking about. Um, the episode where Kronos was on Earth. And... Um, they were like trying to add Earth into the Protected Planets Treaty. Um, ah, yes. Who was that? Who ruined that? <laughs> um, this is my. When you said that there was a woman gold who was coming through in the spaceship that we'd see later, but we didn't actually see them in that episode. Is that is this the one you're talking about? No, 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 no. No. This is the episode where um you and Kronos and Nirti and Thor are all at the base and some one of the Gawold breaks the rules Prior during the t- t- the thing. Nirti is the one who like fucked Mm. over the asgard treaty so we've seen her twice once when she was trying to kill cassandra and once when she was trying to kill everyone on and start on like the whole sgc so like sure sure. Mm -hmm. we don't have very good feelings about our team yeah not Um, like top notch for us no 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 she's like honestly almost as annoying as um apophis in my opinion because um she doesn't show up as often and when she does it's just like next level fucking shit up for no reason she feels like a like a hathor and maybe it's because they're both women i don't know yeah but like when they come Uh in they come in like hard so and so this was the last time we saw her was in season three episode three um which was a weird season because this episode immediately followed the episode with Seth. And then Cold. it was, yeah. And then it was followed by the episode where, um, Daniel went cuckoo bananas because of the virus where he was seeing shit and we had to lock him up in the padded room. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it was a very wild. Like, which one? <laughs> yes. Daniel going to Google Bananas is not a very clear delineation, but the one where we physically lock right. him up in a padded room. Um, and he yes, was like yes. seeing Stargates pop out of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, a good time. Good time was had by all. Um, every, but, every day. So they send him help over. They figure out the air is clear. They go to the planet. Um. They're walking around the forest that Cassandra keeps talking about, and they find a weird bioluminescent handprint on a tree. And when they touch it, a fire turns on, and then they walk towards the fire, and um, gold rings take them away. Um, and it transports them to a laboratory that is somewhere that clearly belongs to Nerti. And it seems that Nerti was running some kind of experiment with the children. Um, which was where the curing them came from. So the kids would get sick, wander off into the forest because they had some weird instinct that they had to go to the forest to get drawn to the handprint and the fire. And then she would take them into their lab, do whatever experiment she did, and then send them back and they would be magically cured. Um, Back on SGC though, Cassie is- She kind of even feels a little bit like um, Linnea. Yeah. But like Linnea when she lost her memory. (laughs) <laughs> right um yeah. Lin- but Linnea but like add the wrath of gold yeah so yeah. not a good not a good time um, not a good combination no so then back at SGC Cassie is trying to escape and she like gets into a fight with Janet and says a bunch of awful things about how Janet's not her mom and it's really sad and then she gets violent oh my God, and, like, she was like insanely mean and then she like 
pushes Janet across the wall and was like, you don't understand, you're killing me. Um, Sam gets back to report to Hammond and she's like, they need some more time. They're collecting things in the lab, but O'Neill wanted me to like, come let you know how things are going. How is Cassie doing? Is she getting worse? And he's like, why don't you go have a look for yourself? Um, so uh, Sam goes and sees that she is now locked in the isolation chamber because she keeps fucking with the electromagnetic field of the base. And she's talking to Janet and Janet's like, I don't know what we're supposed to tell her. So they decide that they're in fact going to tell her everything and they tell her the truth. And um, she realizes that they don't have an answer. Like they're telling her all of this, but they actually have no plan. Which is scary if you're yeah. Cassandra <laughs> right and I I'm all for like transparency and I also like appreciate that both of them are smart enough and care about her enough to not be like you're gonna get better when they have no idea if she's gonna get better right but that's a lot of information to throw at someone with follow-up I don't know like maybe <laughs> don't say anything yet like give it a couple more hours like yeah this is still really early on so, yeah. Except that I don't actually have any concept of how long the time frame of this episode is. Well, it feels really quick because it feels like she's on, like, a death deadline. Like, right. Like, she it could die feels, in a minute. It feels like all of this is happening in about 45 seconds. Uh-huh. But I think there's at least two weeks go by in this i was thinking less than a week i wasn't sure no 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 no. there's two solid weeks that go by in this Mm -hmm. episode and that will come into play i will explain how i know that it's at least two weeks of that happened in this episode um i i don't know and part of it is i think a large chunk of it might happen after the climax of the episode before the resolution like i think there might be like a solid week in there that we don't see Gotcha. In the recovery part. Mm-hmm. But there's two, there's two full weeks of this episode. Um, hmm. at, at, there's more than two weeks. At, yeah. But, um, okay. so, Tilk, Daniel, and Jack are back still on the planet. They're gathering things from the lab. And Daniel finds a tablet that says something um, about the Hoktor. And they're, like, asking about it. And Tilt just goes, man, I haven't heard that word in a while. Felt like, like a nostalgia, like if someone was, like, Tamagotchi. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but while they're talking, the rings just, like, randomly activate, but no one's there. And Daniel's like, sorry, I might have done that because he had just set something down and he didn't know if he like, was with it. I don't know if it was supposed to be as funny as I found it, but it caught me off guard that he was so like laissez-faire about it. He was like, oh, my bad, guys. Totally me. My bad. And I was like, what would have happened if this would have like blown up the whole room? Like you just activated some rings that didn't really do much, but like think of the consequences that could have happened. Correct. And also like, no, you didn't. Like, I don't know why right. he's just, I don't know why he's just so quick to be like, oh, that might have been me. He was touching the same thing he's been touching the whole time. Right. Right. Um, so that's weird. Um, but then they d- leave, but it appears that someone's still in the lab because we have our fun favorite camera angle of somebody watching them do things when they're not there. Um, then... We're back at SGC and Sam goes in to visit Cassandra and play chess. And this is how we have a time frame of this episode. She says to Cassandra, every Mm -hmm. other Saturday, if I'm on Earth, we play chess. Now, this happens twice in this episode, which means either Sam has changed her schedule or we now have gone to full like Saturday on, Saturday mm-hmm. off, After Saturday on, two mm-hmm. full weeks. Yeah. Because at first I thought you were talking about like the birthday. I was like, no, she probably just went to the birthday, but I forgot at the very end they have chess again. 
So yeah. it was like two so weeks from this two, moment to the end. Yeah, it's two weeks from this moment yeah. to the end, which means however much time happened from the birthday no, party to now, from yeah. whatever time happened from the birthday party to now, even if that was two days, we're now talking 16 days worth of time right. in this episode. Mm. <laughs> no. All of which definitely feels like it happens within seven hours. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Like, if you would have asked me, I would have been, like, three days max. All of it from beginning to end. Three days max. Right. Um, Yeah. But, no, it's 16. So, that's insane. Um, But, so, she goes to play chess with her. And then um, Cassie is still being upset. And she was like, Janet's not my mom. Like, and. and I'm so upset about her behavior. It's like, don't say that. And she's like, why? Like, it's true. And Sam's like, she loves you. And like, she would do anything for you. And like, that is, and and basically Sam's basically like, Janet and I both like, would kill someone for you. Like, Janet is, thinks of you as her own child. So like, you can't, I mean, and here's the thing, even if time runs linear to real life which it does not in the show um but even if it even if it did minimum cassie's been living her with her for three full years it's obviously much more than that because yeah. the oldest cassie could have been in that first episode is probably 11 or 12 and the youngest she is in this episode is, is 15 or 16 that's what I'm saying. I was thinking she was like eight or nine in that first episode. Well, that's what I'm saying. The oldest she could have been is 11. Yeah. And the youngest she could be right now is 15. So that's four years if we're talking the farthest outliers of her age. Yeah. So. Um, but it's probably more like eight to 16. So. Yeah, that's what I was feeling. Um, so, um, she takes, starts taking the chessboard apart and then Cassie just like puts her hand out and a knight flies into her hand. But also and that's super cool. Sam's like, I'm super into that. How did you do that? And she's like, I don't know. I just thought about it. And then she goes on a very weird diatribe about Jack and chess and none of it feels relevant to the episode, except for she says one line that I really, really love because I think it's like for someone who is so emotionally crippled in this episode, she's seeing things in a way that other people don't. And mm-hmm. she says, Jack spends so much time pretending he's not as smart as he really is. And I was like, mm-hmm. I love that because it's so true jack is not stupid it is he's not but he man he says some dumb things sometimes well and then it's funny he's so smart it's funny because the next time we see him he is ranting about how knights are horses (laughs) so yeah um but and sam basically is like nothing changes what I see you like that we see you for who you are like we know who you are she was like she was like even if your head starts spinning around in circles and even then like the exorcist (laughs) even then I will still see you um but (laughs) then we get to the team discussing things and this is where Jack goes off about the fact that horses are and knights are the same thing because they fucking look like horses which (laughs) I mean well, he's, he's not, not wrong. I'd give it to him. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but we find out that Near T was like running an experiment to basically create the perfect advanced human for her new host. And this word Hoktar is like basically an offensive slang for like better humans. <laughs> um and it's like it's, when they say I, I watch too much Harry Potter. It's like when they start talking about the pure bloods and yeah, and Slytherins and such. Yeah, kind of, yes, but also like even less so. It would more like be like if the um the wizards had like a nice 
like a, a fake nice nickname for house elves or something like it's like mm-hmm. i'm looking down on you but i'm saying that you're better right right um so but so she has this plan she wants to make this new like more advanced better human to be the new host and so far none of the children like succeeded and so basically what she did when she was quote unquote curing them was she was resetting them so that they still had the genetic ability to pass down the retrovirus but it wasn't an active virus in their system because it was killing them and if they died they couldn't pass it down and she needed more generation after generation after generation to keep passing these genes down until they got to a human that was actually strong enough to do this and um yep maybe it's cassandra um maybe not we don't know and even at the end of this episode we still really don't actually know um but (laughs) janet cannot control what's happening to cassie it is getting out of control the medicine she's giving her isn't helping um like nothing's working and so she goes to talk to cassie to like kind of like just tell her she has to keep fighting and cassie's like aggressively rotating a chess piece in the air in front of her with her mind um made me happy (laughs) but also it turns out that it's not actually like aggression so much as she's transferring the heat from her body into the chess piece because her fever is rising so rapidly that she cannot cool down which is fascinating it's fascinating it's amazing i now have decided that if i have any if i actually had any legitimate superpower it would be the power to add or subtract heat to my body just by thinking about it well you think about it like heat and everything is all like like heat and energy kind of go together because of the way the molecules move and everything so people that are aliens that are not us have weird molecule talents that we don't have so it makes right. sense that they're well, able to and, do this like and you think about it right and you think about it like a tire spinning too fast can catch on fire because you're transferring mm-hmm. heat but why can't i take that same concept and transfer it kinetically out of my body or back into my body when my toes are fucking cold because the world hates us seriously um and she's so while she's doing this she's like trying to keep her body temperature regulated but also she's like basically accepted that death is going to happen she's like either i'm going to transform into whatever this is that i'm potentially going to transform into or i'm going to die and like it is what it is and it's like can you not feel that way please like let's fight (laughs) um yeah and so janet goes to tell sam everything that she's figured out and um sam's like well let me go talk to her and janet thanks her and they walk out of the computer lab and someone starts pressing buttons on the computer Mm -hmm. and cassie tells talks to sam and she's like why did you stay with me even though i was gonna explode and Sam was like, I don't know. I just I just knew that you would be okay. Like, I had an instinct that it would be okay. And she's like, I think that's what's happening to me, too. Like, I just I just know some it's going to be okay. And I'm just kind of accepted it. Mm-hmm. And um, so she's like, so I'm going to take a nap now because, like, I feel better. And then we see Janet still doing some work in her lab. And she leaves her lab. And um, this invisible thing that's been moving around all the labs um, reveals itself. And it is near T going through all of Janet's paperwork. Um, but Janet Oops. forgot her badge. And so she goes back to get it. And she doesn't see near T, but she does see all of her stuff moved around. Um, but she's not nearly as concerned as she needs to be. She's just, it's like, she looks at it like, oh, maybe I forgot that I put it there. I think that she is so stressed out about mm-hmm. uh, uh, Cassandra that she like genuinely doesn't remember if she fucked up or not so but then she looks at the x-ray and she's like oh my god bone fragments like there might be other bone fragments on the other planet with this retrovirus in it we can do more experiments like we got to figure this out and she goes to talk to sam 
And Sam is like, I understand that you are desperate, but that the, at the, the four year old cremated bones will not have acto, active retroviruses in them. Like that's not, yeah. That's, you, you're not making self, sense yourself and you know it. You're just, but as that they're trying, straws. right. But as they're talking about the whole base alarm goes off. And um, Sam and Janet run down to Cassie and Cassie's like, I don't know what it is, but there's definitely a gold in this room. And Sam's like, how do you know? Like, I didn't sense it. Because once again, Sam's superpower only works when it's convenient. It doesn't work. Yeah. And um, she's like, I don't know. Somebody was here and they were invisible. But then, like, I felt it. And um, they just now, after 40 minutes or or eight days of having conversations <laughs> about this, remember that the Gould who had Nirti as a prisoner was Kronos, who they fucking killed last season. You know, they need to have, like, a log. Like, I keep a log of Marvel movies I watch, and that's not life or death. They need to keep a log of gods they have or have not killed and where they are currently located. They have one? I didn't hear that in the mic, but I read your lips, so... No, they, they have one. They have mission reports. They have records. Everything that Refer. fucking... Ex- Refer to it. Or they should have... I mean, they have computers. But then, they have you couldn't, they, then you couldn't have a massive info dump middle of a plot episode if they just knew what they were fucking talking about. Well, see, here's the thing. Even so, there's a way to write around this because just have notes like if you destroy a god, it sets off an alarm that another god was related. And now, no, there's no answer, but you know that this other god has been freed. Right. And so right. now there's chaos in the world until you find them. Because they're just so dumb about it. They're like, there might be a Gawuld on base. And then they're like, how is that possible? And Teal's like, well, Nirti is able to turn invisible. And then Daniel's like, oh, yeah. And we killed Kronos. Now, here's the thing. For the average viewer, aka Courtney, um, who forgot that we've seen Nier Team multiple times mm-hmm. in the se- in the show already, remembering that Kronos was the one who took her prisoner after she fucked up the Asgardian treaty. Maybe you didn't remember that. Not a thing. Not a bit. Fantastic. Great. You didn't remember mm-hmm. that. I did. That's different. Mm-hmm. You know who definitely should have? SG1. SG1. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. So um, they're like, oh my god, that must be who used the rings in the lab. They must have. She must have come back on base with us. I hate when SG One is stupid, just because the plot doesn't work if they're not. Right. Right. There's but so much then, better ways you could write this. But then, speaking of stupid, Cassie is like, I understand. Nerti waited this long to reveal herself because she needed to know if it worked and it must have. So it's okay. Just let me transform. Ma'am. What? I don't think that's what that means. She was in captivity until like a couple months ago. That's why she hasn't revealed herself before now. No, but I mean, in the base, because at this point, we're talking about the fact that this has been like seven days of her walking around the base behind them, because right. time doesn't make sense in this episode either. So um, then they're all off searching the base for Nirti, and Nirti begins to attack, um, but um, Jack stops her and shoots her and dats her, and Cassie starts to convulse, and everything is not looking super hot. Um, and then Jack and Hammond take uh, Nearty into holding and they ask her what's happening. And she's like, I can help, but I'm not going to. Why are you here? You are just and here to like, make people angry. She's like, I will, I will help, but you have to let me leave with my invisibility cloak in, um, tact. And I want a vial of her blood. And Hammond's like, how about the fuck you will? Um, so, uh, 
Then Janet is still fighting to get Cassandra better, and she just keeps trying to let it happen, and it's all not going well, and Cassie's like, just let me die, and Janet is, like, losing all sense of being a valid medical practitioner, um, which I kind of like because we never get to see her like that. Like, she is so, so solid, even when it's the people she cares about at work. Like, even when it's Sam, even when it's the people she cares about the most. Mm -hmm. And it's so nice to be like, no, she's still a human. She still has people that she cares about so much that she will stop being rational. Because um, we all get that way. Right. Would make you inhuman. Yeah. If you didn't have something that stopped you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, then Jack and Sam are like, we have to let Nirti do this. Like, we have to help. And um, Jack goes, it's not like negotiating with terrorists. And Ham goes, actually, that's exactly <laughs> what this is. I was like, what, Jack? What? That's exactly what this is. <laughs> um, and he's like, you're getting very emotional. And Jack's like, yes, I am. Why aren't you? <laughs> and Teal's like, guys. I kind of agree with Hammond. We should probably not. And Tilt's just like, yes, it's sad. It is a sacrifice. We lose a child. I'm not happy about it. Also, go old system lord. Small baby child you love. One of these things is not like the other. Mm -hmm, mm And Tilk is 100% right. He's just 100% not human. Like, and that is... Exactly. (laughs) One of my favorite things, because I'm like reptile brain is like oh yes tilk is right we cannot the greater good heart is like but it's Cassie. you can't do that yeah um and so they're still fighting and trying to figure out what to do and um janet goes a wall and just straight up walks up into the holding <laughs> cell and pulls a gun on near T and is like, fix my daughter. I was like, who are these people? What's happening? I get <laughs> it. But <laughs> um, and then so then they're like, uh, General Hammond, if you would come to the holding center, that'd be great. So he gets down there and um the whole and the She's like, I don't know what's happening. This lady's just holding a gun to me. We had an agreement. I don't know what to do. And Hammond's like, I have already decided that I'm going to give in. And, like, the team's already convinced me that this is the correct thing to do. Like, we will be making this deal with you. And she's like, how are you going to prove that? He's like, all I have is my word. And she goes, your word's not enough. He goes, that's cool. My word doesn't have to be enough because this woman who has a gun to your face is the <laughs> mother of the child who's dying. And so, like, I got my hands are he's like pa- he's like Pontius Pilate really, in this moment. I don't know nothing about it. Right. Because Either you're Hammond gonna is, do it or you're gonna get shot. <laughs> right. Hammond's but like, we'll also I, let you go if you do it. So yeah, Hammond's like, I I will help you, or I will pretend I didn't know that you got shot. Like, I don't know what you want from me. Um. So near T saves Cassandra and they do in fact hold up their end of the bargain and let her go. And she's like, that's really noble of you because I for sure would not have done the same thing. (laughs) I was like, look, I mean, fair. I never thought she would. So yeah. And Jack's like, Oh, we don't know this address you dialed. Like, are you going to be safe out there? And she goes, don't try to follow me. This is not my final destination. I'm going to go build another world and start my experiments again. So like, good fucking luck. But also like, why would she go directly where she's trying to like, yeah. She's like, are you new? Right. Because that's exactly what SG one would do. They would, take the direct path no matter what, even if someone was trying to kill them. Yeah. Um, But then we go, so then she leaves and with a looming threat that Nerti is going to be a problem. And then we just have a really sweet scene where once again, it's Saturday because it's now been 16 days since this episode started. Um, (laughs) And um, Sam's like, it's Saturday. She brought her chest set and Sandra's doing her homework and they're just chatting and Sam starts teasing her for having a boyfriend and it's all really sweet and um, happy and it's a good way to end the episode. I'm like, 
the rest of the episode. Good times, so. good times. Yeah, this episode was fine. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, I don't really have any trivia other than the stuff about um, Colleen and Katie. So, uh, what are your thoughts, theories, predictions? Any Anything that you have? Well, in 78 more episodes, we'll see Cassandra again. Cool. Um, I'll count. I'll do math when we okay. get there. Um, I... I know we're going darker this season, but we are only on episode six today. So like we got some room to grow. Um, I still think this is the the season Hammond leaves. Okay. Um, But I just like, I don't really know. Like how, how, how am I to know which way we're going after this situation? Great question. Sorry. I'm doing the math to see what is 78 episodes from now. Great. Um, I don't think we'll see Nirti again this season, based on the history of the show. Um, I think that'll be a season six thing, unless she's like the season finale, um, which would also kind of be an anomaly. Seventy-eight episodes from now is not about Cassandra. <laughs> it's just, um, but also, <laughs> um, that also is 78 episodes of SG one from now, but 78 episodes of SG one from now, mm. we will be in the crossover era. Ooh. So maybe, maybe, oh, maybe, maybe fun. the episode, maybe the episode that is technically 78 episodes away from now, isn't actually the episode that's 78 episodes away from now. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so huh. fun times fun times yeah. yeah i mean that's all i have i don't really know what's going on in the world um i don't think anything crazy is going to happen with the main crew other than hammond yeah. um we finally killed apophis so like who's left i don't know well that we know if we've killed chronos we've killed apophis we've killed sokar hathor. we've killed hathor every god so. every god that we have Every scowled system lord that we have seen up to this point, we have killed. We also know that that's not the end of them. Yeah. Well, Obviously. we also heard about Osiris and Isis. One of yeah, them so, got killed, though, in the... Oh, yes. So Isis, that's true. Osiris is um, Osiris is still out there because it's right. Dr. Gordner. So Osiris and Nirti are the only two that we mm-hmm. know that we know that are still alive and out there functioning. Right. Don't worry, they are if you look at the the fact that we now know that the Egyptian or that the Egyptian gods are not the so the Norse gods are the Asgards. But so far we've found out that the Egyptian gods, the Greek gods, and, and, the, Roman. and the Roman gods and some weird Chinese gods that we don't really know a lot about oh, right. are all in the pantheon of potentially go old. So that gives us a list of, I don't know, 87 billion potential system lords still out there. Yeah, I don't think we're coming back to Osiris or Nirti this season unless it's like finale-esque. I think they're going to throw a wrench in our plans and something wild's going to happen. Fair enough. Um, I will tell you that um, the next episode, my little tiny spoiler, is that the next episode is a returning character that you did not think we would see this soon. So... Um, I'm just not recurring returning so not four recurring can be returning characters too it can be I consider them slightly different I see Uh, because well no because I I I I, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so i consider like our main our main sg cast is mm-hmm. like obviously and then the i can cons- the, the well the the five the six janet and hammond and the four janet and hammond yeah so like there's the six and when walter because walter's just always there um sure. but so like there's like the the crew the core sg crew and then mm-hmm. there's like the consider the tier that i consider like recurring characters and that's people like 
Mayborn Braytac. and Thor and Braytac. And they're like characters that we have like significant understanding of their story. Um, but they're not there all the time. I bet it's the Senator Kinsey. And well, and I was gonna say, and then there's the next tier of people who like, well, and then there's also the tier of people that are like, um, big bads. Yeah. So like Apophis wasn't there all the time, but he was looming as a big bad. The replicators don't show up as often as we want them to, but they're looming in the story as a big bad. And then there's the tier of people that like, we know who they are. The the stories connect. They show up like once a season or once every two seasons. Whenever they or feel th- like it. But they're not like. They're not. Top in of the, the list. They're not. Yes. And so when I say returning, I tend to mean those characters that are like, we've seen them th- maybe three or four times, maybe one or two times, but they're not like significant plot characters, if that makes sense. It's Kinsey. Okay. I hate it. Speaking of people you hate, who do you want to punch? Oh, God. oh my gosh, I forgot to punch people. <laughs> I forgot how this works. Um do 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 do. Um, you know, I want to punch Cassie because she was really mean to Janet. I understand she was sickly, but she was really mean to Janet. That's fair. Um, I'm really torn on this one because I mean Cassie was rude. Um, I feel like the correct answer is near T obviously but sure. i think i think more than that i would like to punch the collective group of every single person working at the sgc who conveniently forgot that chronos was dead yeah yeah fair um who is your mvp i think i'm gonna go sam because she's the only one who really called cassie out for her behavior absolutely and, but also in like a loving way like she's like we're yeah. still doing our like every other weekend of chess but also you need to know that you're being a terrible person and you need to not knock it off yeah um i really do feel like that is probably the only potential answer but i'm gonna go <laughs> with hammond because he Put his team first. He tried to do it in, mm-hmm. as an, in as scientifically and logically sound way as possible. He heard every side of the story before he made decisions. But at the end of the day, he protected his people. And then also he um, threatened to turn a blind eye to Janet shooting near teeth faces. So like, <laughs> look, if Janet pulls a gun, there's a reason. <laughs> right. So, you know, I get it. Um, yeah. So um, that is that. That's how I feel about that. Um. If you have feelings about when we're going to see Nirti again or um, who might be appearing in next week's episode, please reach out to us at dothanaliens at gmail.com or follow us on any of the social media at dothanaliens. You can follow me at E-N-K-A-Y underscore superstar. And you can find me at cecloud13. And if you really want to see me completely unravel as a human being, Stay tuned and check us out on Thriller Thursday later this week. Bye.